Looking at the ethics of the Decalogue, I believe we're ready for Commandment 9. The study is in detail on a series of tapes, if you want the details, but what we have here is a summary of the ethical principles of Ten Commandments. Because we're studying biblical ethics and Again, we need to know what the intent of God was in giving the law. Commandment 9 is Exodus 20, verse 16. Exodus 20 and verse 16. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. That's the principle. We're giving the spiritual principles. That's the principle of truthfulness. Well, that has two aspects. First of all, it's respect for another's name and character. The principle involves respect for another's name and character. That would be false witness, which would result in perjury, slander, gossip, criticism, which in turn would result in repetitions and lives being besmirched or ruined. So not bearing false witness isn't just not telling a lie to uh, in court, but it would deal with uh, respect for another's name and character. I have here Proverbs 6, verses 16 to 19. These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him, a proud look, a lying tongue. So God hates a lying tongue. Exodus 23, 1, also. Thou shalt not raise a false report. False report, gossip. Proverbs 26, 20 speaks directly of gossip. See, most gossip is untrue. I mean, it's may have a source or basis in truth by the time he gets told four or five times goes around the world six or eight times I doubt if you hear the way it was even the second time 2620 where no wood is there the fire goeth out <laughs> where there is no tail bearer the strife ceaseth, ceaseth. people just keep their mouths shut about everything they hear unless it would edify their hearers, Paul says, then at least half the trouble in the world would be solved overnight. Yes, it would. Read James 3. You might want to write down James 3. That'll tell you what the tongue does. Sets the whole world on fire, James says. It itself is set on fire by hell. Ephesians 4.29 Speak only that which will edify your brother. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto your hearers. Well, I'll say it long enough so everybody in the church will practice it. Not everybody is practicing it. Don't carry tales. Where there is no wood, the fire goeth out, the Bible says. What good does it do to carry a tale? Or to tell me what somebody said about me, or how they looked when I said so-and-so. <laughs> or to talk among yourselves if you don't carry them to me. Just forget it. Pray about the situation. Now, the Bible said that. I didn't introduce it because I've been as guilty as anyone else in the past, but there's one thing I don't do, and I can say 
that with sincerity is to carry gossip and tales. There isn't one of you in the church that knows anything that you don't need to know from me. And there's a whole lot that's gone on that wouldn't edify you. And I don't mean like, you know, we got great big problems. But uh, if you just accumulate it all over a period to bring to the church, to have you pray about it and think about it and vote about it, and <clears throat> it's already solved. Amen. See, all of those things you didn't learn, it, you didn't lose any sleep, get any ulcers, or have to worry about it. I recognize uh, human nature, the average person likes to worry and likes to hear the negative. That's why they can sell the movie magazines. <laughs> and some other magazines and what they call news the views of the commentators it should be called views not news because good good news is not news you never hear about that and when they don't have any good news they suggest and by innuendo constantly I listen to news as I eat and <laughs> Constantly, when there's no news, they'll make some. But it's not news, it's views. They'll, t they'll say, so-and-so's coming on now with the news, and then he gives his views. You never hear the news. <laughs> and um, like Nixon, they took, <laughs> took a, just to give you for an example, took a picture <clears throat> of him. He was walking along the beach without his shoes, hands, and he was thinking or meditating. You ever walked along the beach uh, marching like a soldier? You know, if you're by yourself. And said he looked depressed, dejected, all stooped over. And from about 500 yards with a telephoto, they got that picture. And so they built a whole story around the way he looked 500 yards away. <laughs> How would they know whether he's depressed or not, or what he's thinking about? Then they gave a report the other day. I heard it. Uh, he went. He. Uh, they always make it like he's coming out of hiding. Now I'm not justifying his conduct one way or another. I'm talking about the evil reports. You don't get good reports over the news because it's views. And he came out and went to some uh, public uh, uh, exercise, military review or something. And so they reviewed the fact that he was there, then they ended up the statement, but he still only comes out on his own terms. You can still only see him on his own terms. You know, whatever that had to do with what they were reporting about where, but see, they've got to get that in there to make it sound like, uh, well, get you to thinking negative. And they do the same with Ford and President Ford and all the others. Yeah, praise the Lord. Well, anyhow... Where there is no wood, the fire goeth out. Tail, where there is no tail bear, the strife ceases. ceases. Then a, uh, a second aspect of the principle of truthfulness is respect for truthfulness and honesty in all our relationships. It's respect for truthfulness and honesty in all our relationships. Since I'm here in Ephesians, I'll read uh, Ephesians 4.25. Was. Wherefore, put away lying, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbors, for we are members one of another. Ephesians 4.25. Colossians 3.9. Lie not one to another, seeing that you've put off the old man with his deeds. Not lie. Revelation 21, verse 8 and verse 27 tells you liars have their part in the lake of fire. <clears throat> now for details, I say, you listen to the tapes because we go into extensive teaching on these various commandments but we want you to see the Old Testament morality and ethical understanding of morality and ethics that brings us to uh, the last commandment the tenth commandment spiritual principle got it here somewhere 
That's Exodus 27, Exodus 20, 17. Of course, the reason we look at this is because the Decalogue is to the Old Testament, as we said, what the Sermon on the Mount is to the New Testament with respect to ethics and conduct and how we should live. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. The principle, what is the spiritual principle? It forbids an inordinate desire for the things of others. It's a prohibition against an in having an inordinate desire for the things of others. Now, if you violate this commandment, <clears throat> you will be breaking others also. That's why it's last. It deals with attitudes and motives. See, if you violate this commandment, you can break several of the others. See, stealing is the result of coveting another's possessions. So you break that commandment. When you covet, you've already sinned. You broke the tenth commandment when you coveted that man's car. But if you steal it, then you break the commandments, thou, commandment, thou shalt not steal. So stealing is a result of coveting another's property. Adultery results from coveting another's marriage partner. So you break the commandment against adultery and coveting. See how this one is tied in to the others. Lying is often the result of coveting will cause a person to lie. You might, for example, covet his position or accomplishments. And so you start with lies exalting yourself above him or putting him down with white lies or half-truths. Just by coveting another's accomplishments, you say, well, have you heard he really didn't write that book, he had a ghostwriter, and uh, you may not know that, but you're just telling a lie to discredit him because you really covet his recognition or position. Now, the New Testament principle against coveting is found in many passages, like 1 John 2, 15 to 17. As we said at the beginning, in looking at the ethics of the Decalogue, there isn't a single commandment whose principle is not clearly taught all through the New Testament, and this is no exception. 1 John 2, 15, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but of the world, and the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Matthew 6, 31 to 33, prohibits coveting. Jesus said, don't do us the Gentiles. Spend your time trying to accumulate goods that moths eat and rust can corrupt and thieves break in and steal. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things that the Gentiles and most Christians seek after, he said, will be given you. So Matthew 6 deals with coveting. Colossians 3, verse 5. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, See, mortify, put to death the desire to covet. Covetousness, which he says is idolatry. In other words, a person who covets something, that be, that's an idol to him. He's, so in the New Testament, you have the full understanding what it means, thou shalt not covet. If you covet that man's ox or his ass or his uh, house or his wife or husband or whatever, that has become your idol. That's the thing that you are 
concentrating your attention and allegiance and desire upon. 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10 speaks of the prohibition of coveting. 1 Corinthians 6. Know ye not that unrighteousness shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous. He said these won't enter the kingdom. And he puts a covetous person in relationship with fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, uh, sodomites, abusers of themselves, thieves, drunkards, revilers, extortioners. He says none of these, including covetors, will, those who covet, will inherit the kingdom of God. Now if you believe John 3.16, you have to believe that. You can't have it both ways. Liars won't be in the kingdom. Now he didn't say if you ever told a lie you couldn't be saved. A liar has the character of a liar, has the nature of a liar. He said liars. He didn't say if you ever told a lie. Not that that would justify it, but no one would get in, would they? But liars will not inherit the kingdom. A person could covet and repent of it, but a covetous person, that's his nature. And such will not enter the kingdom of God. Well, we've been a few weeks on Old Testament ethics. Now let's come to New Testament ethical principles. We're still in the first half of the course where we study only principles and we'll get into the practice, the application of the principles to conduct. How should you act if a burglar enters your home and threatens you and tries to steal your goods? Well, a good red-blooded American would know what to do, but what would a Christian do? What would you do if you were unjustly treated and beaten like Paul three times, 40 stripes apiece? You'd get a petition if you were a good red-blooded American and get that kind of police force eliminated. <clears throat> get some understanding people in here who understand human nature better. Spend millions of taxpayers' dollars rehabilitating people who that less than 2% ever get rehabilitated who go to prison. That's the biggest failure. Prisons are not rehabilitation centers. That's the brainwashing, if you believe that, that you receive through your liberal politicians and the unregenerate psychiatrists and marshmallow Christians. Prisons, the Bible shows you what a prison's for, is to keep people in there who can't behave themselves. Less than 2% get rehabilitated. Praise God for those who do. Rehabilitation is the answer. If it gets a few people from the barn in there with the gospel, as is happening in some places and other places too that we know of, that's real rehabilitation. That's regeneration. Then, then they do change. But what, what would be a Christian's attitude? And so we need to know the principles before we look at the practice. What would be his attitude in any situation? I want to give you some distinctive characteristics of New Testament ethics. Distinctive characteristics. <clears throat> now remember the principles are as important as the practice, so we can't overemphasize that. We get the principles working in our heart, in our lives. We won't even have to ask questions. What should I do? What was Brother Freeman's phone number? Let me call him. What should I do? I've just been threatened by my employer. If I don't quit talking about Jesus and the Holy Spirit, I'll be discharged. What should I do, Brother Freeman? I'd say, praise the Lord. <laughs> My brother, so upon the death of my father, is by 
unfair means taking my inheritance. Should I go to court? I believe I could win the case if I'd go to court. What should I do as a Christian? Well, you know what most Christians would tell you to do? Because they don't know the word. And if they know it, they say, oh, well, that, you really don't take that literally. <laughs> First Corinthians 6, don't go to law. Amen. Matthew 5, 6, and 7, if they take your coat, give them your cloak also. Amen. Turn the other cheek. You can really empty churches teaching that. I've, I have just about emptied a classroom of preachers in the seminary teaching that. That's what the Bible says. And if you get the principles working, you just react as Christ would react. You just do what you should do without having to call somebody or think. All right, distinctive characteristics of Christian ethics. Now, unlike Aristotle or the philosophers, Jesus, you have to keep this in mind, Jesus was not a moral philosopher or a political and social reformer. He was a redeemer and savior. And when people try to apply New Testament teaching to an unregenerate world out there, they are wasting their time. The liberals, the modernists, the social gospel movement finally found that out to their sorrow. World War II disillusioned all the reformers of society, taking the Sermon on the Mount and teaching it to the world, educating the world, cleaning up the slums, improving politics, and man... We can teach him how to love his neighbor and we'll have heaven on earth. They were going to bring the kingdom of God on earth through teaching the Bible to an unregenerate world. Then when World War II came and the foundations crumbled and the whole world was plunged into chaos, uh, it did more to discredit liberalism, modernism, and social gospel movement than anything else. And then we had the rise of neo-orthodoxy. All that's in our book, Every Wind of Doctrine. Neo-orthodoxy was a reaction to liberalism. Liberalism, man is good, climbing up by evolution to being better. He'll be God. And neo-orthodoxy <clears throat> takes a biblical emphasis that man is a sinner and moves from that, of course, but it's liberalism in a new dress, so you end up the same place with either one. But Jesus, keep in mind, did not try to reform politics. He was no social reformer. He was not a philosopher. He didn't teach morals and ethics. He was a redeemer and savior. Now, of course, when we say something like that, there's always somebody, well, now, why are we studying ethics? Well, just hold on to get all the principles. The next one will explain it. The ethics of Jesus, as well as the New Testament, do not constitute a system of ethical and moral rules, but set forth eternal spiritual principles. Now, this is important, what we're going to say. Set forth eternal spiritual principles which are intended to be guidelines for the motivation of conduct. That's the key to studying biblical ethics is because we're not setting up a system of rules. Jesus didn't. Do's and don'ts, what should I do and not do and what's sin and what isn't. That has uh, its place in a message, what is sinful and what is right and wrong, but we're not setting up a system of rules, but we have and we're setting forth eternal spiritual principles which are intended to be guidelines for conduct. No, guidelines for the motivation of conduct. So we've said before, everybody is a little Catholic or a Jew at heart. He wants ten commandments in every situation, every decision he has to make. He'd like to have a little rule, do this, don't do that. But the New Testament does not do that. It sets forth great eternal spiritual principles which are guidelines to motivate your conduct. It doesn't tell you what your conduct should be, but to motivate it. 
Now, that isn't absolute, of course, because right away you can think, thou shalt not tell a lie. That's pretty concrete. But then, what is a lie, you see? So we have to get the principle there. Just not telling all the truth sometimes can be a lie. Then, on the other hand, you don't have to tell all you know in some situations. Jesus said you didn't. Don't cast your pearls before swine. I don't walk into denominational church and bring my message on manifestation of the sons of God. I don't even do that among some charismatics who have stumbled over the term not realizing Romans 8 says they will be manifested. And, uh, well, anyhow, these are guidelines to motivate you. Thirdly, the ethics of the New Testament is a Christian ethic. The ethics of the New Testament is a Christian ethic that is applicable only to believers under grace. Don't ever try to get someone who's not under grace to obey the commandments of Jesus. Like Sunday blue laws, we'll be dealing with things like that later. Is it is it scriptural to try to pass blue laws in a community where all the business is closed? Well, I think you can already see from what we've studied thus far. Church cannot legislate to the community. Only in Israel was the theocracy and the nation one because God was its king. But only in the church is God king. Out there in the world, you can't legislate for them. You can't take the teachings or the law or anything and the law, the Sabbath commandments, what they're trying to apply to an unregenerate community. No wonder they rise up in arms. But the church, you know, thinks it's doing God a favor. Uh, and we're not even under that law. See, they're, not, they're, they're legalistically bound themselves. Most Christians don't even know it. They're trying to apply a Sabbath command to the community, and they're not even under the, the law themselves. Well... So the Christian ethic is a Christian ethic. It's for believers under grace. And a lot of believers don't even know they're under grace. So you can't take the Sermon on the Mount to every church. Now don't anyone quarrel with that or I can spend uh, the next hour easily giving you testimonies of my experience where I've taken these teachings to churches and the seminary and so forth. And my greatest resistance has been from pro professing Christians. And finally, ministers who are, some of them in the pulpit, some who are studying for the ministry say, in conclusion, when they see Jesus said it, and it isn't Hobart Freeman's idea, he said turn the other cheek, he said give them your coat, he said not go to law, then they, the conclusion of the matter, we can't live it. It's just too much. So, we're talking about it's an ethic for believers who know they're under grace. If you don't know it, you'll be most miserable, not only in this church, but in the, in the study of biblical ethics. You'll be miserable. Because the Bible doesn't give you the privilege of killing a person who's trespassing on your property. And there's nowhere in the Bible says the church is to take the teachings of the Bible and clean up politics and legislate, so, motivate social reforms like a lot of your leaders in your liberal churches try to get all the racial problems and social problems and welfare problems uh, changed by marching, you know, get in these marches. What a spectacle. Could you imagine <laughs> Jesus and the apostles linked arm in arm marching down Main Street <coughs> trying to liberate the slaves. Well, the Bible, and the Bible doesn't approve slavery, and I certainly don't. But the Bible says if you're a slave, thank God for it and serve Jesus in it. That's your calling, he said. Well, that's in the Bible. We'll get to it. In the streams, it, Jesus and the apostles never tried to free the slaves. They had more slaves than they've got had in this country. And that certainly doesn't justify it. That's a sin that America's paying for right now. But it's another thing for a slave to try to free himself by violent means. Violent means. We've got tapes on that too. The racial 
problem. Well, don't, don't, uh, don't judge everything by thoughts we th throw out because we'll deal with them in due time. But that's why I say it's rather shocking to find out what Jesus taught about the Christian life. He said, whatever state you find yourself in, be content. He said, are you free? Then praise God and serve God in it. Are you a slave? Praise God and serve God in it. Paul spent two years one time in prison, never occurred to him to try to write a letter to the governor or to get his rights or anything else. He felt like he was fulfilling the will of God there sitting in a cell. Another characteristic, distinctive or characteristic, Christian ethics is conduct. Christian ethics is conduct. See, Christianity isn't just a system of worship, it's a way of life. It's something you take home with you. Religion and morality are inseparable in the Bible. Christianity doesn't separate worship from life, Christianity from conduct. <clears throat> You'd never know it <laughs> if you grew up in the average church. Because like in many religions and in institutional Christianity, often there's no real relationship between worship on Sunday and how you live the rest of the week. No one sees any relation, and they'd be offended if the Pope had tried to make a real relationship. If, you know, they really got the message that he means what he says, and we're to respond to that and obey the Lord. Like one church I pastored, First Baptist Church, the honeymoon was over in 30 days. <clears throat> they called me because of the sermons I preached. My, I was on trial, you know, trial sermons. And by 30 days, it finally dawned on them I was preaching to them. <laughs> they said, you preach like people are lost in a Baptist church. Imagine that. I should have known better than that. How can anyone be lost in a Baptist church? <laughs> Isn't that pathetic? Well, as I've said to you before, they were all lost. Everyone down to the last toenail. Because the lost ones left and the ones who stayed came and made confessions of faith and I baptized every one of them. Some of them deacons. Sunday school teachers. The whole bit. By their own admission. I guess if you make confession of faith and get baptized, do that all over, that must have said I was lost before. Well, anyway, <clears throat> that's another story, but Christianity is conduct. Religion and morality are inseparable in the Bible. That's the message of the Bible. Let me give you some passages, like James 1, verse 22. Be you doers of the word. Now you've heard that all your Christian life, but he means do it. <laughs> you know, we say, be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Amen, that's right. And then go right on out and take somebody to court if they hit your automobile. What should I do, Brother Freeman? He didn't have any insurance. I've been hit three times pretty well demolished in one of them. In that case, he had no insurance. But you see, that principle was working that I began to praise the Lord and he had another car for me in the next state. We were on a, on a tour of the country speaking. But be ye doers of the word, not hearers only. Verses 26 and 27, If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is in vain. What is Christianity? He tells you in the next verse, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this. Practice your religion. Visit the fatherless. <coughs> widows, fatherless would be orphans, widows in their affliction and keep yourself unspotted from the word. Do the wor world, do the word, you see. Well, you knew that was there. James 
2, verses 14 to 17. What does it profit, my brethren, though a man say he has faith, but he doesn't have the life to prove it? He hath not works. Can faith save him? If it's just talk, that's what he means. Then he gives a practical example of how to put your Christianity to work. If your brother or sister be naked or destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled. And I'll pray for you that the Lord will bless you. Notwithstanding you give him not those things which are needful to the body, what does it profit? Even so faith that hath not works is dead being alone. In Matthew 22, verses 35 to 39, there's where Jesus answers the scribe's question, what is the greatest commandment? And he says, love God and love your neighbor. You remember that. Love God with all your heart, your neighbor as yourself. Now in that passage, loving God, that's worship. Love your neighbor as yourself, that's conduct. Because you have to practice that, you see. And so religion, conduct, are inseparable in the Bible. It's right there in that commandment. Love God, religion, love your neighbor, morality. Our ethical conduct. Micah 6, 6 to 8. Wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the Most High? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my child, my firstborn, for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Is this what the Lord wants? Offerings even of the best, rivers of oil, thousands of rams. No, he has showed thee, O man, what is good. And what doth the Lord require of thee but to do righteousness, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God? Do righteousness. Righteousness is something you do. Oh, I thought it was something you are, somebody says. Well, you're not righteous if you're not doing righteousness. The message of the Bible. And then Luke 10, 25 to 37 is the parable of the Good Samaritan where Jesus shows how to translate religion into conduct. Parable of the Good Samaritan where they said, the question was asked, Lord, who is my neighbor? <clears throat> what, how did he answer that? Well, your neighbor is the person living on the left over there and the one on the right and the one across the street. That's your neighbor. No, Jesus gave a parable. He said there was a certain man went down to Jericho and fell among thieves. Priest came along, looked at his watch. He saw him over, oh, he fell among thieves and was injured and robbed and injured and he came along, saw his condition, looked at his watch, said, well, if I hurry, I can just make it by the time they make the last announcement and introduce me to speak. Levite came along and uh, he passed by on the other side. He was a little too busy or too, he had just gone through purification rites and didn't want to get himself uh, defiled and have to go through that again. <clears throat> then a Samaritan came along and put his Christianity into practice, that is his religion into practice. So that's what the parable means, that Christianity is conduct. It's not just a religion on Sunday. It's what you take home with you today. It's what you'll take to work tomorrow or Monday. What you take to school with you. It's just another way of saying Christianity is the way we live. It's worship and conduct. Another characteristic, and this probably is the most important thing we'll say, about the distinctions. Christianity is based, Christian ethics rather, Christian ethics is based upon motives, 
not just conduct. Conduct is important, but Christian ethics is based upon motives, not just conduct. You see, too often there's a separation between worship on Sunday and the way you live during the week. That's why we said Christianity is conduct. But it isn't just conduct. Christianity and the Christian ethic is based upon motives. In Christianity, it's not just what you do, but why did you do what you did? That's the principle we're setting forth here. It's, in Christianity, it is not just what we do, but why did we do what we did? Motive. And that's where God looks, in the heart. See, the Pharisees kept the letter of the law. They honored God with their lips, but Jesus said, your heart is far from him. So it isn't just conduct, because the Pharisee could keep the letter. The rich young ruler, when Jesus said, uh, when he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said, well, keep the commandments. Now, obviously, we don't want to digress that he didn't say you can be saved by keeping the law, but that was the revelation for that period, obey God. That showed a man was righteous because he tried to obey, then the system of sacrifice took care of when he missed and transgressed. So he said, keep the commandments. He said, well, I've done that from my youth up. And then he said, well, Sell what you have, give to the poor, and come and follow me. Which we read he was uh, reluctant to do, went away sorrowful. And Jesus said it's impossible for a rich man, almost impossible for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And the point is that the rich young ruler had been keeping the letter of the law, but he had not kept the inner meaning because he couldn't obey Jesus at the point of discipleship. And so it's not just conduct that we're concerned with in Christian ethics or the Christian life, but the motive. You see, right conduct with a wrong motive in God's sight, may not be in your sight, but in God's sight, is just as bad as wrong conduct. Right conduct with a wrong motive is as bad in God's sight as wrong conduct. Now, that's why this course isn't for a person who isn't under grace, because statements like that just cut cross-grained everything that you like to believe or you've been taught. And yet that's precisely what the Bible teaches. God looks at the motive. Unfeigned love for God and your neighbor is the basic motive for all conduct. That's what's going to motivate you. And uh, it's not just any kind of love, but the love of the Bible is a self-giving love. It gives when it gets nothing back. It gives when it knows it's going to get slapped in the face. Now, the importance of this distinctive characteristic of Christian ethics is to be seen in the fact that many at least some, but I believe you could say many, non-Christians outwardly can come close to living the Christian ethic. They can do that outwardly. That's why salvation, Christianity, isn't just involved with conduct, but with motive. I'll give you one example among many. Gandhi. Now, he was living when I was a youth, but uh, some of you may have been born since then. His dates are... 1869 to 1948. But surely everybody in the room knows Mahatma Gandhi, knows of him. He was the Hindu political social reformer. This man was moral, he was upright, and he did something that no one in the room does. He read the Sermon on the Mount every morning. How many of you do that? But what was his motive? Now, you've studied history in school, so you know about Gandhi, who led in great, when I say great, I mean tremendous social, political reforms in his country, 
will go on long fast. But what was his motive? You see, Christianity isn't just concerned with what you do, but why you do what you do, the inner motive. <clears throat> That's why going to church, reading your Bible, uh, helping the poor is not proof you're a Christian because Gandhi could beat that all to pieces. And he read Sermon on the Mount every morning to boot. But what was his motive inwardly for doing this? Was it for God's glory? No, it was for social improvement. We're giving you his motives. Political reform. For self-satisfaction, which is what the Bible calls self-righteousness. None of his work and reformation was done in the name of Jesus, which would disqualify it for acceptance in God's sight. Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. Hebrews 11.6. That's faith in Jesus Christ, basically. In Romans 14.23, that which is not of faith is sin. And if it's not motivated by Christian faith, to God it is sin because it's not for his glory and he won't accept it. Therefore, I'm saying that this is the, one of the basic things that will motivate uh, you in your conduct, so be sure you're getting some of this. This is the most important principle that we're setting forth. One of the most important so I started to say, therefore, we have to make a distinction between moral acts or good works that are acceptable in the eyes of the world and those same works that are acceptable to God. We have to distinguish between the two. Because many things are morally acceptable by the world and by the church, but not by God. In other words, <clears throat> what the Bible says, that apart from the Christian faith, it's impossible to please God. That means it's impossible to perform a single righteous act he will accept. Uh, we've said that many times, given many proof texts for it, but I'd like to give you just one here, Matthew 7, 17. Let me, let me check the verse real quickly. It's either 17 or 18. Matthew 7, 718. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Now, dear friends, the next phrase, I didn't write it. I didn't invent it. Human nature might like to disagree with it, but Jesus said it. A corrupt tree cannot produce good fruit. The heart has to be made right first by Christian faith before God will accept a work from any sinner. Now that may shock contemporary Christian sensibilities somewhat, but it isn't going to change the fact that Jesus taught it. A corrupt tree cannot produce good fruit. He didn't say it did some good works occasionally. It cannot do good fruit. Produce it. A declaration is absolute. You can't change it. People get their reason, their emotions, their compassion, their logic in it, and that's where they miss the message of the Bible. Oh, but I saw, someone says, uh, I saw a person who was injured on the highway and somebody came along and I knew the guy, he's unsaved, and he took his coat out and put under him. So he'd put under his head, fold it up so he'd be more comfortable. I've seen men and women that I know are not Christian, somebody says, who, would, who were kind to their neighbors, sit on, up all night with a sick friend, give to the poor, and die for the country. Yes, thousands have died for the country. You mean these are not good works? You mean God doesn't look down and write all those down and somehow credit that to that person's account? Well, let's hear the whole story. The Bible does not say, the Bible does not say that the sinner without faith cannot perform socially praiseworthy deeds of mercy and kindness. The Bible doesn't say a sinner without Christ cannot perform socially praiseworthy deeds of mercy and kindness. I mean, the world demonstrates that it, that it can. Humanism proves that they can. They do a lot of good things that are socially praiseworthy. 
Bible doesn't say that a sinner cannot perform an act that would result in good to someone else. It doesn't imply that a sinner without Christ couldn't do something that would result in good to somebody else. But what it does say is that a man without Christian faith cannot perform, first of all, cannot perform any action that isn't tainted or distorted by sin. Now, there's just a little bit of overlapping there with our study in biblical theology, but it's all right. That is, if you remember what we taught you in biblical theology a couple of weeks ago along this line. That a sinner cannot perform any actions not tainted by sin. He cannot, secondly, perform any unselfish action. He cannot, thirdly, perform any moral act as the basis for which God will approve, justify, or accept him. Because, you see, that's works and that's rejected by God. Galatians 2.16. Galatians 2.16, any, any of the passages say we're not justified by works, but by faith. Isaiah 64.6, 6, for those of you who didn't hear the theological teaching that may just be visiting this morning, all our works are as filth, all our works of righteousness are as filthy rags in God's sight. Even though I became the brunt of opposition to such teaching, you know, I didn't make any of this up. God said it. I couldn't understand why ministerial students got... It's right at this point where, uh, where uh, relations broke down in the class years ago. It did. actually broke down. We almost had a riot. <laughs> ministerial students. And I understood it because I understand the human heart. And they were just typical denominational Christians that didn't want to believe these things because somehow down the deep recesses of your heart, if you're honest with yourself, there's something that wants to think, well, now what I'm doing, God is watching and uh, I'm going to hear that voice, well done, thou good and faithful servant. We don't like to hear with this ear, after you've done all you can, say I'm still an unprofitable servant. We like to think that what we're doing and uh, we don't want anyone to get up and say that God won't accept a good act unless it's by faith, because that will, you know, out of the sinner, because that will reflect on the average church member, because he likes to think that he's being accepted by his works, even though he gets up and quotes Ephesians 2, 8, 9, saved by grace. All of your works. That's why you can... Do a lot of things that look good, but God doesn't accept them. The church is busy, 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 busy by a lot of things God never ordained in his word. If you don't believe that, go to church next Sunday and watch, not critically, but just take your pencil and paper if you can't remember, and you list all the things they do and waste your time with that's not in the word. That's just any service. And if you take all week, you wouldn't have time to brush your teeth just to for writing notes what's not, not in the Bible. I'm talking about principles. You don't have to always have it spelled out in verse. You might stop in the hallway on the way out uh, after between Sunday school and church and ask that person what he's doing out there with those books. You take an audit, inventory. Oh no, these are the records of our good works. We've got 37 people in the Fidelis class that are 100% Christians today. Now, of course, we had six there. They're only 90% Christians because they forgot to bring their money and two are too poor to give. So that's 10% on the six-point record system. Shall we go on? <laughs> and then that's filed away in a safe somewhere for the next pastor to burn up or, or feel bad over if he can't meet the quota. So if he's doing good, he likes to put a board up there this time last year. <laughs> today, the offering today, $148.16. Why couldn't he even pay my heap on that? 
And they think that's a big thing. Last year, 98.32. This year in Sunday school, this morning in Sunday school. <laughs> Shall we go on? 79. Last year was only 34. Well, if you just trust the Lord and let him work it out, you won't even have to send out any advertisements and you can't seat them. You have to go on TV. Close circuit TV. <laughs> But what we're saying is that the human heart doesn't like to accept that fact that God will not accept a work that uh, isn't motivated properly. Why are sinners' works, why do sinners' works lack, lack acceptable motives? Is because apart from faith, we've said that everything he does is motivated by either selfishness or sin. Now that's obvious if you just think about it for a moment because a person who is not in Christ doing what he does in faith and for God's glory obeying the Lord, then he may do a good deed that results in good to someone else, but in God's sight he didn't do it for his glory, whom he doesn't acknowledge. He performed it without faith, he did it to satisfy some selfish desire. However noble it may be, it was still his desire to do this. Satisfying his conscience, he goes to church Sunday morning. He isn't doing it because he wants to worship his Lord in fellowship with the other saints. So even a religious work, Matthew 6, can be motivated wrongly. Fasting, prayer, giving of alms, you see, outside faith, whatever a man does, whether it's a religious work or a good deed which results in good to someone else, to God is not acceptable. And it is seen as sin on that person's part in the sense that it wasn't done for God's glory. And God, believe me, is first of all concerned for his glory and not getting an overcoat wrapped up under somebody's head lying on the highway. Now, you understand that in the context of what we're, which we're talking about. What you do is, first of all, because you love God and you want to glorify him in your life. And he said a corrupt tree can't produce good fruit. Let me give you an example which satisfied the class that was rebelling against, rebelling against the Sermon on the Mount and thought they were rebelling against Hobart Freeman's ideas. Let me show you, you can't argue with it. I save, there's, there's a boy, a seven-year-old boy, falls off into the water, off the end of the pier, can't swim. I jump in and save him. I rescue him. His parents live in that big home there on the lake, rich. And I come carrying that offering to the parents. Oh, they thank me. And the papers write it up. And this fellow jumped in. Save this child, ruined his clothes. No thought for himself. And you see, what I've done has resulted in a good deed, both for the boy and the parents. But in my heart, I know they're rich. And surely they're not going to let this go by without a little reward. You see, then... What has happened? God isn't looking at just the act. He sees the act, but he's looking at the heart, he says. And while my outward act resulted in good to somebody else, my very act of saving him was sin to me because my motive was wrong. I did it selfishly. I did it for reward. You see why without faith, without your desire to glorify God, you can't please him. You take... Well, you can diagram it like this. Here's God, and here's the Christian, and he operates in the faith realm. So everything he does is motivated and directed toward God. Here's the sinner, and here's self. He isn't even related to God, so everything he does is related to himself, even when it results in good to somebody. He sits up all night with that sick friend because, well, that's my friend. I play poker with him. We fish together. I don't want him to die. I've grown accustomed to having him around. We tell jokes together. 
You see, the, God knows the heart. I'm not making this up. Well, what about, you know, where he gives a kidney for his daughter? Well, that's his daughter. That belongs to him. That's his property. He doesn't want to lose that. Certainly he'd feel sorry and be remorseful if she died. And this is his only alternative is to give a kidney. But you see, he's not doing this in the faith realm and because he's doing what he does for God's glory. He can't glorify God because everything he does is wrapped up in self-interest. Even though it looks noble, it's still self-interest. That's my wife. I bend over backwards, you see, because she belongs to me. Or that's my child or husband. Well, if Matthew 7.17 doesn't settle it for you, where a corrupt tree cannot produce good fruit, then how about leaving you with one more, Proverbs 21.4. This ought to settle it for anybody. How God looks at whatever a man does outside faith. Proverbs 21 and verse 4. I call your attention to the second half of the verse that even the plowing of the wicked is sin. <laughs> That's what it says. He can't even hoe his corn or plow his field. God says he's sinning. Oh, you think about that for a while. I don't know why I should have to interpret it. What's he plowing for? To get some money so he can buy some booze or build him a house on Sunday yeah. or do something outside his desire to glorify God whom he doesn't even acknowledge so everything he does is, is perpetuating himself and his sinful desires even though some of them will be noble and look good in the eyes of the community in the eyes of God they don't look good because whatever he does is not to glorify God and believe it. Remember we studied in theology the glory of God and God is jealous for his glory. He's concerned about his glory. He is more concerned about his glory than you are. Now God being God, he, he can do that. And you better, if you get concerned about God's glory first, then he'll take care of the rest. Even the plowing of the wicked is sin. I t I'll tell you, friends, I'm glad that verse is there because, as I say, it was Matthew 7:17 7, in that verse and the illustration I gave about uh, rescuing a drowning boy that helped convince these little rebels that, <coughs> that God just isn't going to accept our works outside Christ. All our works of righteousness are as filthy rags. God said it, since God's God, then we better conform to what he says and not get our emotions in it. Praise the Lord. All right, we start there next time.